Hi there everybody, this is Professor Tomney with another Chem Complete video, and we are going to continue to wrap up our alcohol chapter for Organic Chemistry 2 today. So, the next reaction, we just took a look at some of the alcohol reactions we learned in Organic Chemistry 1. There's two major reactions left, dehydration and oxidation. And so, dehydration is what I would really like to focus on um, today. So dehydration is the removal of water. If you think of hydrations, when we learned how to take alkenes and create alcohol groups on them, that was the process of hydration. So dehydration is going to be the reverse process in which I will take an alcohol, because these are reactions of alcohols, and I will remove a proton. Basically, I'm essentially doing an elimination reaction here and I will end up with an alkene. So let's take a look at a specific example of this, and then we will also talk about some more detailed results of this mechanism when we go through it. So in order to dehydrate, I'm going to need an acid. H3O plus is usually sufficient when we're talking about this because you want a strong acid, and again, most strong acids, when you put them into water, become H3O+. So H2SO4, HCl, they all will completely ionize to H3O+. So the first thing that's going to happen in this dehydration is that the alcohol will behave as a base because I have an acid present here. Remember, alcohols are amphoteric, meaning they can act as an acid or a base, depending on what else is present in solution. And this alcohol will pick up a proton, acting as a Lewis base, and the extra electrons from this bond will go back to the oxygen on the H3O+, which will create water. So the first step along the dehydration pathway here is that we will protonate the alcohol in order to create water. Now water is going to make an excellent leaving group once it has been protonated like this on the ring. So the water, the next step is that the water is going to leave. And when the water leaves, we will be left with a carbocation. This is acceptable. It's a secondary carbocation. Um, this will proceed quicker when we have tertiaries because a tertiary carbocation is going to be better in terms of stability than a secondary carbocation. However, if I take a look at this carbocation, I now have to decide, okay, how am I going to get up to this product? Well, I have protons that are present adjacent to the carbocation. And I also have water. I have generated water. It just left as a leaving group. And keep in mind that whenever I have H3O+, I really have H2O present in solution. So this water will come by and remove one of these protons. Now, because this is essentially an E1 reaction, meaning I have a carbocation, I do not have requirements for, uh, excuse me, I do not have requirements for anti-periplanar removal. So remember, anti-periplanar states that when I have a leaving group, if I want to remove a proton adjacent to that leaving group at the same time the leaving group is leaving, that it has to be 180 degrees away. That's for E2 reactions. We're not concerned with that here. So either of these protons are legitimate. We could also say either of these protons, because the uh, molecule is symmetrical here, it would give us the same product. I can remove any four of these protons, okay? What I cannot remove is the proton that would be found right here. I cannot remove the proton directly found by the carbocation. It has to be one space adjacent to that carbocation. So the water takes one of these protons. The electrons from the bond would come up to satisfy the carbocation by forming a pi bond. And that is what we end up with. So we are going to take the process of dehydration is going to take an alcohol. Now keep in mind, we're really looking for a secondary or a tertiary alcohol when we're doing this. And we can use acid. I should also mention we want to apply heat when we're doing a dehydration. That helps to drive some of the excess water off and move the reaction forward. 
So if you take a look here, water is one of the products as it's coming off as a leaving group. If you go back and you study Le Chatelier's principle, if we can drive off and remove water, it can help push this reaction forward. Um, heat also helps to favor elimination over any type of substitution. So it's a good idea to do heating anytime you're interested in an elimination. And then we have an alkene. Uh, wait a minute. A-L-K-E-N-E. -E. We have an alkene as the final compound here. Now, one of the things, because uh, this was a symmetrical molecule that we didn't really talk about, is Zaitsev's rule. Okay, No matter how you spell it, um, I usually spell it with a Y, Zaitsev rule, Zaitsev's rule. Um, whenever you have Zaitsev's rule present, it's basically stating, if I can form multiple products, and in this case I could only form one, but if I can form multiple products, I'm going to form in abundance the higher substituted alkene. So higher substituted alkene is going to predominate. Now if you remember back to your organic one knowledge, this is really a result of hyperconjugation. So what we stated was I can either have a monosubstituted alkene, where a monosubstituted alkene would be something like this, carbon, carbon. I look at the four bonds, and I'd have a hydrogen, a hydrogen. There's an R group here and a hydrogen. That would be mono. And so di substituted, right, would mean that I have two R groups with two hydrogens, and that would be di. And then I would have tri and tetra. So when I get all the way to tetra, I'm going to move down here so I have a little more space, okay? If I got all the way to tetra, we're talking about R, carbon, double bond carbon, R, and I have R groups or alkyl groups the entire way around. That would be the tetra substituted. And this has the highest stability because I get lots of hyperconjugation alignment from the neighboring R groups into these P orbitals that are found hosting the pi bonds. And that's a very uh, stabilizing process when you take a look at the stability of the alkenes. So let's take a look at an example where this might be possible. Um, I will, so let's, we'll move away from a cyclic one. Let's go ahead and do a chained version. Uh, do not forget about carbocation rearrangements in these reactions, just something important to bring up here. Okay, and so let's go ahead, we'll say that we've got this here. Uh, let's make this another R group, so that'll be a methyl, right? And there's only a hydrogen here. And this will be our compound. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm already given the answer. Hang on a second, guys. Sorry. All right. I'll come up with a different molecule. So uh, we'll do it somewhat similar. Okay. Here we go. We got to start with the alcohol, right? I'm giving you guys the alkene to start with. So start with the alcohol. All right. So if the alcohol is here, right? We want to figure out what our product's going to be. So this is a CH3 down here that I'm drawing out. And there's potential products when we're looking at this. So H3O+, plus. you just saw the mechanism. I'm not going to run through the entire mechanism every single time that I do this. But the question is, what products are we going to be interested in? Well, I know that this is going to form a carbocation. And if I take a look at the carbocation it's going to form... I actually do have a shift here because I would initially form a carbocation here, right? And then this is a tertiary position next to a secondary position. So what's going to happen is this hydride is going to shift. So I'm going to have a hydride shift. And I'm really drawing this out because I want to analyze all the surrounding areas to the carbocation to figure out what the most stable product is going to be. And so there we go. That would be the carbocation in that tertiary position. So let's say I have hydrogens here, right? I have hydrogens here. Don't forget, a lot of students forget methyl groups that are coming off of this carbocation. These hydrogens are adjacent to that carbocation, so they count, right? And then I have hydrogens here. All right, so the question is, what different products will I come up with? Well, I can remove one here. That would form a double bond here. So what would that look like? Well, product one is going to place a double bond right here. That's where we just discussed, right? This second portion here. I would have the methyl group still coming down here. 
and then I would finish off with what I had. So that's the first option. The second option is that I could remove one of these and I could create a double bond there. So option number two, I'm going to have the main chain and then I'm going to have a carbon-carbon double bond sticking off of that main chain. So that's the alkene that's present there. And then finally, number three, I could take one of these guys. So if I took one of these and move that there, number three would look something like this. I'm going to keep that, keep that. I do keep the methyl here. Now I've got the double bond here, right? And then this continues with so on and so forth. So actually, let's, let's clean that up just a little bit so it looks nicer. So we're going to erase that. That is where it belongs. I just want it to be very clear that there we go. That would be the third product there, right? That alkene. So the question is, which alkene is going to predominate? Well, in this case, you really have two of them that could potentially uh, show up in quite an abundance. So this right here is a tri-substituted. And if I look at that, that's because I've got one, I've got two, I've got three groups surrounding my double bond. This fourth group is a hydrogen. This one is only di-substituted because I've got one group here and I've got another group right here. So that would be di. So already we know this would not be Zaitsev's product. That's a lower substitution pattern. And then finally here I've got one, I've got two, and I've got three. So this would be tri. So both of these could potentially be uh, major products and that's fine you can have more than one major product it might be sort of starting to split hairs you technically are gonna have one major product right if I analyze all of these by gas chromatograph one of these two is probably gonna be slightly higher than the other might have something to do with branching um, or one of the rearrangements but if you take a look um, at these they're both tri substituted and so for the most part I'm still going to have both of these in bulk in comparison to the dye substituted. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Now, I'm going to give uh, one more example here so that you can really get a, a good idea for this. And we will go back to doing a ring here. So let's say that I've got a CH3, right? And I also have an alcohol. So this alcohol is going to be the one involved in the dehydration. And then I also have another CH3 group down here, right? And the only other thing I have behind it is a regular hydrogen. So nothing particularly special back there. If I subject this to H3O plus and heat, the question is what potential products could I get? Well, let me take a look. If I protonate and remove that alcohol using the mechanism, right? So this is going to come, grab a hydrogen, that would go to the H2O, and then we would have the H2O leave. And so I leave a tertiary carbocation behind. And I've still got my CH3 and my hydrogen right? So now I have to take a look at all the potential adjacent hydrogens. Do not forget that there are hydrogens up here as well. So I can pick one of these. I can certainly pick from this carbon here because these hydrogens are one carbon away from the carbocation. And then this carbon down here, not this CH3, I cannot take from that because that is, if I look at the carbocation carbon here, which I'm making a dot, right? If I go down, here's one carbon and here's two carbons when I get down here. Whereas this CH3, I only have to jump one carbon and I'm there. So remember, they have to be adjacent, which means this hydrogen is available for removal. So I can either have this or I can have this or I can have one of these guys form a double bond here. So see if you can create all those products. You can pause the video if you want, but I'm going to move along here. So feel free to follow along or to uh, unpause it afterwards and check the different answers. So from the hydrogens that originate at the top, right? That's a, try to make that a little more sharp. 
Okay. Oh, this looks horrible. Hang on. All right. Redraw. Okay. So from the hydrogens at the top, these two hydrogens up here, right? If I pick one of those, I'm going to get the alkene, the double bond right here. I would keep the methyl group that's here, and I would also keep the methyl group and the hydrogen that are down here. They would not have been touched if I went for this hydrogen up here. So that's one potential product. The next one, so plus, I will also get another five-membered ring. And this time, if I select from one of these hydrogens, based on the methyl group adjacent to the carbocation, I'm going to get this as my second product. Hopefully you came across that. And then finally, number three, if I were to go through this one more time, and I remove this hydrogen back here near the carbocation, I'm going to have the CH3 down here. I removed the hydrogen and gave its electrons to this side of the ring. This CH3 is still present. I didn't do anything with that in this case. And the H is up here present. So the question is, which one is Zaitsev's rule, one, two, or three? Well, hopefully you realize that it is number three. Now, why is it number three? Take the double bond and see how many surrounding R groups there are. So in this one, I have one R group, two, including the whole bulk of the chain coming down here, R groups, and then three R groups, right? This double bond, there's still a hydrogen up there. So that's tri-substituted. This one, you should easily be able to see is di substituted. I split off this way and I split off this way. So I have two hydrogens back here. This is di substituted, lower substitution pattern. So that's definitely out. It's between a tri and a di right now. So the question is, is this one number three down here, one versus three, is this one going to be higher than tri substituted? Well, I've got one, I've got two, I've got three, and I've got Four. So this double bond here, if you take a look at this ring, right, what we're saying is, all right, you've got an R group here, the ring continues, and as the ring goes inwards, right, this is an R group. This whole portion up here is an R group, this is an R group here, and then I have another R group here. So I do have four. This is tetra, which means that this would be the major product, okay, and both of these would be minor products. Now, which one would be uh, more minor, so to speak, would be number two because it's di-substituted. So hopefully this explains dehydration and Zaitsev's rule. Uh, if you have any questions, you are welcome to leave comments, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Please remember to like the video and subscribe if you appreciate the content, and that will get you in touch with any of my new releases as they come up. So thanks for taking the time to learn, and I will see you guys for the next and final alcohol lesson, which will be on oxidation techniques. So take care, everybody. I'll see you next time.